Today is part three in our August message series, Big Questions, Wrestling with Our Faith. As I mentioned earlier, it's not called Big Answers, so no pressure on Reverend Ann to provide answers today, but she will be helping us wrestle with the question of evil today. And our story today from the scriptures is the story of Cain and Abel. You can find that in your pew Bible on page three of the Old Testament. Now, the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know. And am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me from the soil and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and named it Enoch after his son, Enoch. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another child instead of Abel, because Cain killed him. To Seth also also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to invoke the name of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. First off, I want to say thank you to this congregation for welcoming my parents into the fold, as they say. It's been fun watching them from afar as they rediscover what it means to start over to be the new kids in town making their way through a new church community. Thanks also to Brian for trusting, who I can only assume was my mother, saying, my daughter's a preacher, she's great, you should have her preach sometime. (laughs) And indulging your new congregant by inviting me to the pulpit today, thank you. As I understand it, you've been tackling difficult topics this month, how appropriate since we as a nation have been tackling difficult topics over the past week and a half. Nothing like Nazis to wrap up summer and usher in the fall. So I bring to you today yet another difficult topic, one that truthfully I will barely skim the surface of this morning. But like any theological conversation, I'd like to start with a story. Difficult topic of the week, good and evil us and them. And so I suggest we look at Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. There's nothing like starting at the beginning. To recap the first three chapters of the Hebrew Scriptures, Genesis 1 starts off with a swirl of action, which is one powerful word. God sets the world in motion, creating order out of chaos. The story perfectly mirrored by the poetic and priestly language of worship found in Genesis 1. God spoke, created, saw, named, blessed, and rested. 
God is very efficient. But the pinnacle of creation, men and women, of them God notes, oh, them? They are very good. And God tells humanity, be fruitful, multiply, and take care of the earth I've given you. Well, at least we got the multiply part down. <laughs> Genesis 2 and following has a different rhetoric, however. The author of the second chapter of Genesis focus, focuses less on how powerful God is and more on how loving and near to us God is. The text anthropomorphizes God, who in this creation story walks in the garden. Heavenly hands dig into the mud, and God isn't afraid to get dirty. Halfway through this creation story, we realize it was good probably isn't going to be a refrain we sing. We read about loneliness. God desperately wants Adam to be happy and creates companions for him like animals who aren't good enough. And finally, a woman. There aren't just forests, but good trees and a bad tree. There's a talking animal. He uses manipulation to get what he wants. Genesis 2's creation story stands in direct contrast to the systematic, intentional, and good Genesis 1. And of course, you know the rest of the story, right? After a game of telephone from God to Adam and Adam to Eve and Eve to the serpent, Eve eats the fruit. Adam joins her in juicy deliciousness, and they are thrown out of the garden for disobeying God. Adam has to work the fields, and Eve has to painfully give birth to new life. And sure enough, their first child is born, followed by a second. The brothers grow old enough to choose their own vocations, Cain taking after his father in agriculture, and Abel starting a new family business in animal husbandry. One brother's a farmer, and one's a rancher. And cue sibling rivalry. At eight years old, the youngest Pittman daughter announced that she would not be doing theater. <laughs> Sorry, EJ. She performed in Fiddler on the Roof in the historic Missouri Theater, and when it finished its run, the precocious little thing announced that she was done. She had two older sisters in theater, and after one show herself, she decided she would have none of it. To this day, Emily still won't let my parents put the adorable picture of her and Anna Tevka up on the wall next to the rest of the family's theater memories. If Anne and Amy were going to be in plays and musicals, Emily was going to play tennis. The end. Except sibling rivalry never seems to end no matter how grown up we become. So the competition begins. Cain tills the soil to produce crops like dad. Abel also needs land, but he uses it to tend sheep. As such, Genesis 4-5 indicates a farmer versus herdsman mentality. Later, when Cain establishes the first city in chapter 4-17, it may be an urban versus rural mentality. And without reading the rest of the book, I bet you can already guess which vocation the Israelites adopted as well. Much of Genesis 1 through 11, which is known as prehistory, could be described as etiology. Etiology is the study of why things exist, and it can be both scientific and mythological, both of which carry their own elements of truth. In other words, when a kid asks a parent, why does everyone in our family grow up to shear sheep? The answer might be, well, once upon a time there were two brothers. Or mom, why doesn't a snake have arms or legs? Well, once upon a time there was a garden. Or grandpa, where do rainbows come from? Once upon a time there was a flood. But back to the story. The brothers choose their vocations, and the seeds of sibling rivalry are planted. But the competition escalates when, for some reason, the brothers decide they need to make an offering to God. Now remember, we're at the beginning of the Israelite story. We're in prehistory. We're only in chapter 4 of the first of 39 books. There's been no Sinai at this point, no law, no temple, no rules about sacrifices to God or worship guidelines. But the two men make an offering. Cain gives something he grew, 
and Abel gives a firstling of his flock. And God plays favorites, praising Abel's offering. Oh man, that was a bad idea. Mike and Carol can tell you, you never praise one daughter without having something good to say about the other two. Lord, God must have missed Parenting 101 class offered seventh period right after home ec. <laughs> Clearly, the favoring of his brother upsets Cain. So God confronts Cain about his sunken countenance and warns him to mind his P's and Q's. But Cain invites Abel to go into a field. They fight. Abel dies. And again, God confronts Cain, who responds with the now iconic, am I my brother's keeper? When looking at a Hebrew text, I like to head to the original interpreters to perhaps get a feel for how the Jews, and dare I say Jesus, would have heard this story. Just as Christians have Walter Brueggemann, N.T. Wright, and Jen Hatmaker, the Jews had their rabbis who wrote about the Hebrew texts. Their interpretations of the stories were collected in what is called a midrash. Rather than exploring the ideological why are we herdsmen questions, the midrash raises questions of why do we fight? Why do we go to war? One answer we've already covered. We fight over land and property, and the second should be right behind it. We fight over religion and what we think God likes best. Fortunately, here in America, we've matured to the point that we no longer fight about land, property, or religion, so we'll just keep right on digging into this text. The Midrash offered one interpretation that I found very interesting. It focuses less on the why and more on the conversation afterwards. Look at the infamous verse 9. The word Cain uses for the pronoun I in am I my brother's keeper? The word is anakai. The first person pronoun usually used by people is ani. But Cain uses anokai, a rather uncommon word. In fact, one of the times anakai is used in the Bible is in Exodus 20, at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. Anokai, the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God, with anakai denoting the uniqueness of God. Thus the rabbis understand Cain's use of the word Anakai here not as the first person singular but as another name for God. In other words, Cain doesn't ask am I my brother's keeper but rather isn't God the guardian of my brother? Here we have perhaps the first person to raise the question of theodicy. Can God and evil coexist? Was it not God who was tasked with protecting Abel? Was it not God who failed? Eve didn't know what death was when she argued with the serpent. Is it fair to say that Cain did? In this interpretation, Cain switches the devil made me do it argument around and actually blames God. You planted the evil in me. You didn't protect Abel. You're responsible. Not to pin the blame on the invisible God in the room, but this interpretation raises a question we've all asked. Why do bad things happen to good people? But God is having none of that argument, and like his parents, Cain is cast out. The family of four brutally becomes a family of three and is finally back to a family of two mom and dad alone. But like any good firstborn child, Cain isn't going without a fight. You can't do this to me. Haven't you heard of capital punishment? They're going to kill me. Do I not matter to you at all? He laments to God. Of course, if you're trying to read the Bible literally, you should just give up now and go home. <laughs> The Bible's truth-telling is much more sophisticated than science or history. It's storytelling. As if two different creation stories weren't evidence enough, any eight-year-old who can read from left to right would respond to Cain's lament with, I'm sorry, but what people? We must set aside our need for facts and embrace our need for truth. That's the great part about Judaism, Jesus' religion. 
One story can have multiple meanings and all of them can be true. That's why Jesus never answered a theological question with an ontological truth statement. Instead, he told stories, not just stories, parables. Somehow in the 200 years since Christ, Christianity has managed to lose that beautiful part of the Judeo-Christian story. Told in its entirety, that story is a tradition of so many stories and so many truths inside them. This is gospel. It is literature. Genesis chapter 1 was poetic liturgy. Chapter 2 through 4 is storytelling. And it is in this story that we learn about what is perhaps the most beautiful and poignant truth about God. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. God's response? Not so. And then the hand of God reached out, like in the iconic Michelangelo painting of Cain's dad, <laughs> and God puts a mark on Cain. God marks Cain mine, safe, protected, do not disturb, seats taken. Hollywood got it wrong. <laughs> Even the indigo girls got it wrong. The mark of Cain is not a curse. It's the ultimate sign of grace, of hope. It's the first act of amnesty. It's the first of a lot of things. It's the first story of preference of God for a younger child to an older child. Soon to follow is a preference of Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Joseph over his 11 brothers. Cain has been called everything from the first ginger, thank you Shakespeare, to the first black person, thank you white supremacists. But my favorite first is the grace God pours on Cain. I was reminded of God's narrative, which is told over and over in the Bible while watching X-Men of Days of Future Past. <laughs> in it, Charles Xavier says, just because someone stumbles and loses their path doesn't mean they're lost forever. That is biblical truth. And to make sure Cain gets the message, God gives him a mark, and he gives him back his life. It's a motif that repeats all the way through the Gospels. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. Whether you're a foreigner named Ruth or a disciple named Peter or a Pharisee named Saul, there's always hope. Dying to self, we each are resurrected to walk in the newness of life every single day. And thank God, because the world is getting darker and darker. <laughs> I can hardly read the news anymore in order to preserve the health of my baby and my own sanity. <laughs> the people we put in power to protect us are killing us. <laughs> they're shooting our black children. They're taking away our health care. They're putting semi-automatic weapons into the hands of criminals and people with mental health issues. And we're letting them do it. We're culpable, too. We participate in a system of have and have-nots. Never mind the gap between the billionaires and the homeless people. What about the gap between the millionaires and the lower middle class? When I was a full-time minister, I took a group of college kids to work at an orphanage in Temuco, Chile. The people who ran the home drove us around town uh, one day to show us the depth of Chile's disparity. They drove us through the shanties where children and adults alike lived in cardboard boxes and makeshift dwellings. And then they drove us to the other side of the town and pointed out the huge houses. Have you ever seen anything so big, the guides asked. And I watched my students swallow hard and struggle to answer. Those huge houses were no bigger than 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, and all but maybe one or two of us lived in houses much larger than that in Austin. If Cain could get angry enough to kill his brother, whom we assume he loved, what have we done to people we know nothing about? Every time we cheat on our taxes or take the easy way out, is that one more unfilled pothole in the road? 
One more unfixed leak in the roof of an underprivileged school? Every time we vote for tax breaks on the rich, what is the cost to someone further down the line? Every time we buy a 48 pack of bottled water, what does that cost the environment? And if you think we as a culture aren't targeting black boys and men, you're just in denial. No one gets bragging rights when it comes to righteousness and God. When I was a teenager, I read a lot of Max Licato books. I remember he used jumping as a metaphor for righteousness, and it's always stuck with me. I'm paraphrasing, but Licato says, just because some guy in prison can only jump three inches and you with all your good deeds can jump three feet high, doesn't put either of you at an advantage when your goal is the moon. And that means that even if the most unpopular person in America, whether from your perspective that's Donald Trump or Tina Fey, were to turn to God right now in lamentation and cry out, my punishment is more than I can bear, I shall be hidden from God's face, they would hear God's response, not so. That's the divine nature of the gospel. I'd leave that door shut myself, but God says, not so. Anyone who knocks gets to come inside. Two words, not so. And God surprises creation with grace. No one can separate you from the love of God through Jesus Christ, no matter what you do and no matter what others do to you. Several months ago, my husband and I were invited to New York to have some conversations about our work in Colorado with the National Winter Playwrights Retreat. This was before the Tonys, but even back then, dear Evan Hansen was rumored to be the cream of the crop, so tickets were purchased. Evan Hansen, played flawlessly by Ben Platt, is a teenager with social anxiety disorder who tells a lie that quickly escalates from being told to a classmate's family to circulating the whole school to going viral on social media. Towards the end of the play, as Evan begins to see the damage he's caused with that falsehood, he sings a song of lamentation called Words Fail. I imagine his sentiment resonates in the heart of anyone afraid they've screwed up enough that the face of God will turn away. I'd rather pretend I'm something better than these broken parts. Pretend I'm something other than this mess that I am. Cause then I don't have to look at it and no one gets to look at it. No, no one can really see. Cause I've learned to slam on the brake before I even turn the key, before I make a mistake, before I leave with the worst of me. I never let them see the worst of me. Cause what if everyone saw? What if everyone knew? Would they like what they saw? Or would they hate it too? Well, I just keep on running away from what's true. All I ever do is run. So how do I step in? Step into the sun. Step into the sun. Amen. Let us pray together.
pray to God for the blessing of Anne's ministry here and elsewhere today. We give you thanks. We're grateful for this challenging story that she has brought to us from the Hebrew Scriptures, and we ask that you let it continue to disturb us in the week ahead, that we might consider our own part within the problem of evil in the world, and that we might be open to hearing your word on how we are called to respond in grace and love and hope. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.